remember, as the mission is being executed, vision is being realized, belong, believe, and behave. This morning, um, I want you to grab your Bibles. Um, the message is going to be a little different this morning. Um, I want to take a moment just to talk about um, what I'm going to refer to as the significance of the Lord's Supper. I just want to take a moment to kind of talk through that a little bit. It's first Sunday, and we're going to be dealing with um, the Lord's table this morning. So I want to paint perspective. Um, the Lord really moved in how the service worked this morning and when it way when its way. And I'm praying that you might be able to have some of the same experiences. But as I've been studying this week, the Lord has really uh, rekindled a flame within me as it relates to understanding the significance of his table and understanding more and more of what that is all about. So let's pray and then we'll talk through that, that God will just move and have his way. Holy Spirit, we thank you for you this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for how you're moving. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for the freedom of worship, the freedom to celebrate you, God. Thank you for the expression of worship that was offered up this morning, God. I know you're pleased. And so we give that to you. So as we look at the word, open our hearts to hear, open our hearts to receive, open our hearts to be in tune so we could be your people, Lord. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. If you were to ask, if you were to ask, the average deacon, minister, elder, or church person, what the two ordinances of the church are, here's what they'd say to you. Um, baptism and the Lord's Supper, right? They'd say that. Those are the two ordinances of the church. If you were to press them a little further and say, what's the significance of those two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper, is where the question or the responses may vary a little because I'm not sure that the majority of, of us really understand what that means and what that's all about. So today we want to take a moment to just look at this whole significance of what the Lord's table is all about. Baptism now is a once for all um, event or occasion. And what I mean by that, you get baptized, you're incorporated into the family of God, and that comes subsequent to salvation. All of you know baptism does not save you but it's a follow-up to salvation. The beauty of being incorporated into the family of God, I'm one of those guys that believes Scripture teaches that once you're in, you're in. That's good news, amen? If I'm a part of the family of God, I'm part of the family of God. The Lord's Supper, on the other hand, is more of a, what I'm going to call a repetitive event that the Lord challenges us and encourages us and admonishes us. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me, meaning that it's a ordinance that the church ought to be doing on a frequent basis. The challenge with that, though, is that the more we do it, as time lapses on, it seems as if we lose the significance of what communion is all about. So here's what I want you to understand this morning. Communion on the Lord's Supper is not, when we read it in the book of Matthew and the book of Mark, the book of Luke and then 1 Corinthians is not an isolated event that just exists in isolation. It has deep roots in the Old Testament. Come on, say amen if you know that. There's a lot of Old Testament background around that that I really want us to take a moment to look at this morning so we can understand what it's all about. The Old Testament, it, 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 if we can understand what happens there, what happened there in the Old Testament, we'll find that it paints a clear picture of what Jesus is doing with his disciples in the book of Matthew, in the book of Mark, and in the book of Luke. Now, here's what you need to know. To the Jew, when we look at the Old Testament, Passover or the Feast of the Unleavened Bread has great significance. Matter of fact, it's something that's been handed down traditionally for many, many years throughout the Jewish nation. And even in today's day and age, it's something that they hold in high regard. My concern for Christianity today is that we have what I'm going to refer to as the follow-on or this, this, this ordinance in the New Testament that we don't take as serious historically because we have not made the connection. 
So what I'd like to do this morning as we prepare to go to the Lord's table and walk through the service today is I want to take you back to the Old Testament to lay some foundation for the genesis of the Feast of the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then connect that to the Lord's table in the New Testament. So if you can grab your Bibles with me and go with me to the book of Exodus chapter 20. And here's what I said to first service. I'm challenging people to, I know it's, it, technology is at being advanced and people have phones and iPads and all of that good stuff, but I want to challenge you just to get a Bible, get a good old-fashioned Bible that you can write in. Come on, y'all, that you can read, that you can take with you, that you can, you know what I mean? Because here's what happens with these phones. We get distracted. Somebody texts you doing service, and all of a sudden, they done took you out of worship. Amen. <laughs> the only thing you should use your phone for on Sunday morning is to text to give. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Exodus chapter 12. Did I say 20? So, I'm sorry, Exodus 12. Thank you, thank you. Exodus 12, amen. Exodus 12, I want to walk you through, I want to walk you through uh, this passage of Scripture and then um, try to connect the dots so we can get to where we need to go. Here's what you need to know before I read Exodus 12. Before Exodus 12 was given, the Israelites had been in bondage for over 400 years in captivity in the land of Egypt. And so what God did is after 400 years of supplication and crying out to God, God heard their prayers. And so he sends Moses down to go to Pharaoh to tell Pharaoh, let God's people go. And you all know how the story goes. Um, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and there was a series of 10 plagues that God released over the Egyptian um, in attempts to soften Pharaoh's heart or to reveal that he is God because he was really doing battle against the gods of Egypt. The tenth plague, however, was the plague of the death of the firstborn. And it was at this, at, at subsequent to this particular plague, that Pharaoh's heart would be softened and the people of Israel would be released to go worship God in the mountain. Now, prior to God releasing the plague, here's what he said to Moses. I need you to gather all the Israelites and I need you to take them, allow them to take a lamb and then to kill the lamb and to put the blood on the tops of their door and on the sides of their door, such that when I release the death angel and he sees the blood, guess what's going to happen? Y'all tell me, what's going to happen? He's going to pass over. Exactly. So you all understand that quite well. So let's read. Let me read just a couple of verses in Exodus chapter 12, and then I'm going to connect it to the New Testament. So jump down to verse 3. Let's just pick up at verse 3. Here's what God said to Moses. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of the month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house. A lamb for a household. Come on, say take a lamb. Jump down to verse 5. Your lamb, however, shall be without blemish, a male, uh, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the month. When the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Now notice what verse 7 says. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh that night roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Jump over to verse 11. Notice what verse 11 says. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, with your sandals on your feet, with your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both men and beasts, and on and all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment, for I am Yahweh or the Lord. The blood will be a sign on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I love this. I will pass over you. Come on, say amen. And not only that, but notice that no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now jump down to verse 17. Listen to what 17 says. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on the very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generation as a statue of Forever. Now, don't miss this because what God is saying to the Israelites and to the Jews in verse 17 
is that from henceforth onward and forever, I need you to observe this feast as a sign or a memorial to the delivering acts of God in the land of Egypt. Now notice what verse 23 says. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter the house to strike you. Verse 25 says this, And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, What do you mean by this service? You shall say, It is the sacrifice to the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt. And when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses, and the people bowed their head in worship. What Exodus chapter 12 does is it gives you a brief overview of of the foundation for the Passover feast or for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Here is what happens by way of memorial going on this, from that day forward up until today and even into future generations. The Jewish nation have, as a way of memorializing or remembering the work that Jesus did, has, they have what they refer to as the Seder meal. And what happens at the Seder meal, it's a big festivity, it's a big gathering where they come up together and they remember the finished work of Jesus. I mean, the finished work that God did in releasing them from, from the hand of the Egyptians in setting them free. It's stories that are being told of what God did. And they take that thing so serious, such that if you were to read the book of Acts, you will notice at the opening of the book of Acts that when the Passover came around, there were Jews from all over the world that were congregating together. And here's what you need to know. It was an annual celebration to commemorate the work that, Jesus, that, that um, Moses did when God worked through him to deliver the Israelites from Egypt. Now, I think that was very, very important, very, very critical. But I'm one of those guys that believe the Bible also teaches that the Lord's table is a huge transitional point, and it plays a very, very important role. Here's a statement I want to read as before we go into the New Testament to kind of walk through this. Here, look into this. Here's what this says. There is similarity between the celebration of the Passover as the feast of the Old Covenant and the Lord's Supper as a feast of the New. Don't miss the word similarity up top. The former looks back with thankful remembrance to the people's redemption and liberation from Egypt by the act of God associated with the sacrifice of the Passover lambs. The latter, or the Lord's Supper, it looks back with thankfulness to redemption by the act of God through the sacrifice of Christ. The Apostle Paul, I like this in Corinthians 5 and 7, he links the two when he uses the phrase, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let me help you connect the dots. In the Old Testament, there was a sacrificial lamb that was offered, and here's what the Passover is all about. The lamb was offered as a symbol of God setting them free from Egypt. Every year, they get together to celebrate this event. The Seder meal is a huge remembrance of that particular event. Here's what Paul is saying in the New Testament. We now have a new covenant where our Passover, the Passover of the New Testament, is no different than that of the Old Testament with the exception the lamb is different. Oh, I need a couple of amens in here. Yeah, yeah. The lamb, the lamb is different and God is doing something new. Let me, let me read this before we go into the text this, this morning. So here's what this means. For the Christian, we regularly observe the Lord's Supper, though we appreciate the importance of the Passover in the Old Testament. Let me say it this way, because I don't want no one to misunderstand what I'm saying or misinterpret what I'm saying. The Old Testament Passover is very, very important. It plays some critical, it lays a critical foundation for what we do today, but that was the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we celebrate something different. But that table 
plays a critical role. And when we come to the Lord's table, I'm going to say to you, it ought to be no different than when the Jews approach the table with the Seder meal. I'm going to begin that. And you see how serious they take that. But for Christianity, we seem to have minimized. Lord, help me. We have missed all the traditions, everything that's associated with it because we have minimized the Lord's table. So I want to go to the book of Luke. Go over to the book of Luke. We're going to walk through this. I just want to share a couple of things, uh, four things quickly with you in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 22. And I want to read this event and touch, give you next steps on how we're going to approach our service this morning. Luke chapter 22, look at verse 1. Now, before I even read, here's what I need you to know by way of literary context. Jesus now is nearing the end of his earthly ministry. For 33 years, I need you to hear me say that Jesus had been observing the Passover on an annual basis because it was a tradition of his culture and of his lineage. For 33 years, he got together with families and friends, and they came together, and may I guess it was in Jerusalem, and they celebrated their deliverance from Egypt. They celebrated the Passover or the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. In this instant, something different is about to happen. He's, the, he's about to celebrate the Passover. He knows it's for the last time. His disciples does not know it's the last time. So preparations are being made. So look at what verse 1 of chapter 22 says in the book of Luke. It opens up by saying, Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called the Passover. You see the connection now. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Verse 3 onward kind of talks about how Satan had already entered Judas, and he was setting out to tempt Jesus. Look at verse 7. It says, the day came, then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. And they said to him, where will you have us prepare it? And he said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him in the house that he enters and tell the master of the house, the teacher said to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciple? And he will show you a large upper room furnished, prepare it there. And they went and found it as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. Now verse 14 picks up with them sitting in that room about to partake of the Old Testament Passover meal. You guys are with me? Look at what verse 14 says. When the hour came, he reclined at table with his and his apostle with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Verse 16 says, For I tell you I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now watch the process of the Passover and what Jesus is beginning to do differently. Verse 17. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it amongst yourself. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Four things I want to share, share with you. And here's the first one I want you to take away as it relates to the cup, partaking in the Lord's Supper. In the Old Testament, when you partake of the cup, you partook of the cup because it was symbolizing the fact that you were going to be released from slavery and you were on your way to freedom. Here's what the New Testament begins by saying about the cup. When we share in Jesus' suffering, uh, we are to share in Jesus' suffering by partaking of the cup with him, knowing the day is coming. Let me add this. When we won't have to suffer no more, and will share in his glory with him. Oh, come on, somebody ought to say amen. Yeah, uh, the, the day is coming because 
here, here is what, here's the beauty of what, what this is saying, is, and you got to understand this. When we partake in the Lord's table, when we come to the Lord's table and we take the cup, we are symbolically identifying with the sufferings of Christ. See, somebody has fooled us into thinking that Christianity is all about riches and prosperity and all the nicety and every sickness and ailment that we go through has nothing to do with God. But, but I hate to be the bearer of bad, bad news. If you love God, if you serve God, if you trust God, we have to identify with him in his suffering. Come on, y'all. There are going to be some good times and there's going to be some bad times. There's going to be some rough times. Because here's what you need to know. Each one of those disciples around the table had their own cup. And when Jesus took his cup and he didn't partake of it, he handed it to them. And he said, each of you share it in your own cup. Symbolically, they were identifying with him even though they didn't know it yet. Turn to neighbor and said, neighbor, you've got to suffer with Christ a little. Here's what, here's what one commentator says. Let me read this to you. It says here, um, this, he insists that this gesture, after Jesus' uh, surprising oath and the fact that the disciples all would have had their own cups, would have made a profound impression on them. Drinking the cup of someone was understood to be a means of entering into communion, a communion relationship with that person, and to point that one and to the point that that one shares in the destiny, be it good or bad, of the same person. So here's what he was saying to his disciples. And they didn't even know it. They thought they signed up for all the good stuff. Take this cup and divide it amongst yourself. Meaning, if I'm going to suffer, <laughs> yeah, y'all get it. You're going to have to suffer some. You, you, you must see the difference here because... because in the Old Testament, it was just, we're about to be set free. We're about to be set free. We're about to be set free. And it was all about freedom from Egypt. And the result was they lived a life reflective of the fact that they kept forgetting about God. In the New Testament, Jesus opens up by saying, yeah, you're going to be set free, but you're going to have to go through some things. So we have to share because we're going to identify with him. So when he opens up and he says, take the cup. And then here's what he says, and I won't partake of this until when I come back to receive my church in the consummation of the age when you get to be with me. Now, that, what I like about that is that it's good to know that trouble don't last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I might have to suffer for a little while. Come on, y'all. But I get to be in the presence of God. I need somebody to say Amen. And then look at verse 19. Look at verse 19. Verse 19 says, And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them. And here's what it says. This is what? My body, which is given or broken for you. He took bread. He says, when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Here's the second thing I want y'all to take away. This is very, very important because Jesus starts to switch now. The bread in the new covenant is symbolic of Jesus' body broken on Calvary for the sins of the world. Here is how this is different than the Old Testament. In the Old Testament Passover, the unleavened bread, they just broke it and they ate it. It really had no significance or meaning to it. In the New Testament, he's taking bread and he's breaking it. And as opposed to the old Passover or the Feast of Unleavened Bread, here's what he's saying. This bread now is symbolic of my body, which is being broken for you. Now, here's what he's saying, and, and, and I try not to get ahead of myself. I'm going to go through some things, not for my benefit. Come on, y'all. But for your benefit. I'm going to be persecuted, not for my benefit. Y'all need to hear me. But for your benefit. If there ought to be a reason for us to celebrate the Lord's Supper, like those Jews in the Seder meal celebrated the Passover, is the fact that we should have been the ones on that cross. Come on. We should have been the ones whose bodies were broken, but his body was broken, not for his benefit, 
Come on, y'all need to hear me this morning. Yeah. But for my benefit, maybe you fooled yourself into thinking that you're all good and you're all that, but that's not my testimony, and that's not my story. Come on, I'm a sinner by default. I should have been the one dying on that cross, but he took his own body and he broke it in my place. So if I have a reason to be thankful, oh, you ought to hear me this morning. If there's any group of people that ought to be thankful, I'm going to say this in a few minutes. In the Old Testament, didn't nobody die for their freedom. In the New Testament, oh, y'all didn't hear me. In the Old Testament, it was a lamb or a goat. In the New Testament, it was God. I wish I had somebody himself. If you don't have, uh, you ought to hear me. God himself on that cross for us. It's symbolic of his body broken. And then notice what he says. Notice what he says. He says, do it in remembrance. Do it in remembrance. Do it in remembrance. Come on. Do it in remembrance. Do it in remembrance. When I wake up in the morning and I think about it, I ought to thank him. Before I lay down at night and I think about it, I ought to thank him. On the job, when I think about it, I ought to thank him. I should not have to wait till the first Sunday morning to thank him. I ought to thank him anyhow. I ought to thank him, come on, uh, when the sun rises. I ought to thank him when the sun goes down because of how good he's been to me. Ah, he's been good. So, 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 you see, here's, here's the problem. As the church progresses, communion don't mean much to us anymore. As time progresses, it loses its importance. See, I was raised in a Baptist church. And as a child, I couldn't understand why when I come to church, the table was covered. Y'all not hearing me. Maybe y'all ain't been to a Baptist church. Why the deacons had to have on white gloves. And why the, the deaconesses had to have doilies on their head. Come on, y'all. Maybe you ain't never been to a Baptist church. Come on. Why the preacher had to have on a gown. It's because that event was more important to them than the Passover. Because a sheep did not die in their place in the New Testament. And the symbolism meant something. Now we got cell phones and all kinds of stuff. And here's what, why we got to do all that. It has lost its fervor. Let me go back to the Jewish Seder. Time could go on. They're not going to lose the details that's implied in that feast that they do. If anybody ought to have reasons to keep details, Lord have mercy, it ought to be you and it ought to be me. Come on, say amen if you believe that. Notice what he said, do this in remembrance of me. Then he says, and likewise the cup. After they had eaten, saying, this cup is poured out for you. And notice what he says, new covenant in my blood, poured out new covenant in my blood. Lord, help us. Poured out new covenant in my blood. Look at this. Jesus' blood, Lord, have mercy, poured out on the cross, establishes a new covenant with Christ and his church. This is the difference. This is the difference. This is the difference. You see, here's what poured out mean. The, the grammatical nuance is in the passive voice, and it says when, when someone's blood is being poured out, that person or that thing is being murdered. Here's Old Testament theology. Take a lamb, take a goat, and murder it. Y'all not hearing me. And then let the priest take the blood and put it in a basin. 
and then take the basin and put it on the lintel, the tops and the lintel of your doorpost. And with the excess blood, they throw it at the altar. Come on, that was the priestly rite. That is the, the blood of sheep and goats were being poured out. In the New Testament, I thank God, it wasn't no sheep and it wasn't no goat. It was the blood of my Lord and my Savior. Come on, my deliverer. My healer, come on, my salvation, my, I wish I had somebody in here. It was his blood that was poured out. And what I like about it, he didn't put his blood on no lintel of no door and no side. His blood was on the cross and he placed his blood on me. So I am covered in the blood. That's why the hymnist said, what can wash away my sin? Y'all not hearing me. It was nothing but the blood. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. Y'all not hear me. He said, oh, how precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood. New covenant, baby. New covenant. In the Old Testament, when you sin, another lamb had to die. In the New Testament, when I sin, I'm already covered by the blood of the lamb. Ha! Ah, you gotta hear me, you gotta hear me. His blood washes me. His blood cleanses me. His blood makes me new. I don't know about you. Maybe I'm the only somebody thankful for the blood. But I wish we had a church that would thank God for Calvary that would thank God for what he did, that would thank him for the blood. You think, and please hear me, I don't want to offend nobody, but you think a Passover Seder is going to mean more to me than the Lord's table? I am not undermining the importance of it. Please hear me. It's the foundation for what Jesus did. If anyone ought to have reason to celebrate, it ought to be the church of God. If anyone has reason to thank God, it ought to be the church of God. Are you hearing me? If anyone ought to have reason to say, Lord, I thank you, it ought to be the church of God. So lock into this. Jesus' blood, and lock into the term, it surpasses the blood of the Passover lamb placed on doorposts before the Exodus because his blood established a new covenant. Lock into the Old Testament. The lamb died, but they still had to wait for Jesus to die. I wish I had someone in here. So I don't need a lamb dying in my place. So when Paul says they came together and they broke bread in their homes on a daily basis, he's saying that Seder meal of the Passover, man, they had something new. They didn't forget that because you don't know where you're going unless you understood where you came from. Are you hearing me? So they knew where they came from and so they knew where they were going. They thank God for Egypt, but man, did they thank God for salvation. Y'all not hearing me. This is why they were willing to be radical disciples, because even though they got out of Egypt, they were still waiting to be set free from sin. Oh, I wish I had somebody in here. So don't miss this. Don't miss this. That's why Paul, Paul says this. Jesus our Passover lamb. So here this church, when we think about the Lord's Supper, we ought to reflect on that 
Passover celebration. And we thank God for that. But then the shout really begins. <laughs> the shout really begins. The shout really begins. This morning, I'm asking you all to be patient with us. Be patient. It might go a little long. But I need the worship team to come. I'll be seated for a little while. I need our ministers, elders, deacons. I need them taking their places. I want us to come to the Lord's table. And I want us to come differently. And I said to Pastor Gatani, well, we've got to figure out how to create our own Seder celebration around this table. We've got to figure that out. We've got to figure that out. Because of the importance of this. Here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. And then we're going to endeavor the best way we can symbolically to get as close as we can to that upper room and how we partake in the Lord's Supper. But my prayer is that as you come around the table, that it be a prayer of thanksgiving. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I praise you. Lord, I bless you for the finished work of Calvary because it's about you. It's not about me. And for that, we thank you. Pastor Katani going to come and she's going to pray. And then I'm going to come and give you instructions on what we're going to do. And we're just going to spend the time finishing the service in worship this morning that God would have his way. Just be patient with us. Be patient with us. Be patient with us. I am told, I've never been to one, but, but we are going to have a Seder service on Good Friday. Um, Dr. Delaire from Denver Seminary is going to come. We're going to have a full-blown service. But I'm told that when that happens, it's a long event. And nobody's in a hurry because they know the importance of it. We come to communion, we want to get this done in 10 minutes, 5 minutes. Because it's not important to us. It's got to be important. It must be important. It should be like they did in the Old Testament. Here's what would happen. The Bible says in, in um, Exodus 12, when your children ask you why you're doing this, here's what you say to them. We used to be slaves in Egypt. And God brought us out. Are you with me? Don't ever forget that baby. So you don't go back to slavery. That's what it says in Deuteronomy 4. Says, Write the words on your heart. I mean, it was imprinted in every heart. So you see little baby Jews being raised to understand that story. Here's what this ought to look like. When my children and your children, our grandchildren say, baby, grandma, grandpa, mommy, why we have to do the table every Sunday? Here's what you said, baby, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you what Jesus did for me on Calvary. Let me tell you what Jesus did for you on Calvary. And have those little people at a young age saying, Grandma, Mommy, Daddy, Jesus did all that. Then you can say, yes, baby. And you too can invite him into your life. And have relationship. This table is significant. This table plays a critical role in the church. This table is no ordinary table. And we ought not treat it like that because of what Jesus did. Pastor Kay, pray for us. Then we can allow God to be God. Bless your name, Lord. Bless your name. Most holy God. <sighs> Bless you, Lord. Most holy God, we come to you, God, with our hearts bowed, Lord, and our hands raised, God. We want to thank you, Lord, for the reminder, Father, that when we approach this table, Lord, we are remembering the sacrifice you made on Calvary, Lord. Father God, that you remembered us before we even hit the earth realm, God. You thought of us in generations and the generations to come, Lord. Your love surpassed all of it, God. And you shed your blood for us so that we can be free, Lord. That we can be saved, that we can be experiencing you on a daily basis. So, Father, forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for not remembering correctly what you've done for us. And now, God, as we go into this communion service, we do it in remembrance of you. With the knowledge, Father God, of what was sacrificed and the price that was paid. And we say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.